I'm Mine Uşlar. I'm the coordinator of the interdisciplinary initiative on migration in this Pufendorf Institute. And um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Ruben Anderson. Um, Ruben is an anthropologist at the University of Oxford and a former journalist uh, and one of the most inspiring scholars, I think, in the field of migration and border studies. <laughs> um, in his book, Illegality, I have it here. If we can circulate around as well. Um, he conducted an ethnographic study on European border control and documented the industry uh, that benefits from this border control or migration control. And by doing so, he kind of shifted the focus from the migrant to the vast indus industry that is actually benefits from, from the migratory movements. Um, so with these few words, please join me in welcoming Ruben. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mina, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for inviting me here to such a lovely institute. It's great to be here and meet you. And I think you have a very exciting seminar series. Uh, and I really look forward to our, our discussion. Uh, so as Mina said, uh, the to name of my talk is The Business of Bordering Europe, the subtitle of my book. And then I added in brackets, and beyond. So this is some of the more recent thinking I've been doing, in part on my own, comparatively looking at border controls around the world, in other parts of the world. My original research was at the Spanish-African borders and the extensive borderlands uh, that has uh, emerged between West Africa and, and southern Spain in the recent decades. But now taking that beyond specific Spanish case across uh, the European borderlands and, and, and to other parts of the world. Uh, I'll also try to bring in, and this is quite tentative, some thinking I'm doing together with uh, a colleague, Professor David Keane at the London School of Economics, of comparing different forms of security interventions. I think the so-called fight against illegal migration that we've been seeing along European shores is one type of security intervention, or securitized intervention that can be compared in terms of its logics, its functionings with other forms of uh, intervention. So I'll get to that, but again, it's quite tentative, so I really look forward to, to comments from you all. So I'll start with one of these uh, images we see so much of in the media from the borders of Europe. And excuse my voice, by the way, I keep having this upsets as we all do during autumn and winter here. I hope I'll get through this, this talk anyway. Uh, this is one of those images that show us what migration scholars talk about as a spectacle of migration, the spectacle of borders. This is a Spanish enclave of Melilla in North Africa, a tiny slice of the European Union and of the Schengen area for free movement, surrounded by Morocco, that has become a magnet for undocumented sub-Saharan migrants over uh, recent decades, since the 1990s. Here we see dozens of undocumented migrants strad straddling this triple fencing built in part uh, thanks to EU funds where the, e the border guards, the Spanish border guards, look on below and what we don't see in the picture of the Moroccan forces waiting on the other side for once these migrants climb down and are extra-legally and often violently expelled back into Moroccan hands and so the cycle starts yet again. The limbo in the borderlands gets extended for these migrants. So we keep seeing these kinds of images, this spectacle of migration playing out in the news media and in our politics. And for the time being, it seems like our politicians in the European Union are quite happy to say, well, the spectacle's gone away now, this drama, this crisis, this emergency, we've dealt with it, it's over. Uh, what I think we're rather seeing is this alternation back and forth, which we've seen down the years between the spectacular, dramatic aspects of migration and the hidden, hidden away sides, the chronic sides to what's going on, as we're now seeing in camps in Greece and in horrific conditions in Libya and elsewhere, the problem being pushed elsewhere for the time being. So I start in a way with this picture just to indicate uh, the sort of cycle of, of border controls going on at the external frontiers of the European Union between uh, crisis and uh, a sort of chronic uh, state of, of, of misery and, and difficulty at the borders. But also to invite us, as Mina said, to shift our gaze, and that's what I'll try to do in this presentation, as concerned citizens, as academics, uh, as activists perhaps, uh, 
we're often inclined to look at those migrants stranded in these enormously difficult situations, take their account seriously, listen to their story, understand the suffering uh, at these kinds of border crossing. But uh, what I've done in my research, <coughs> and I know some of us in this room have also done, uh, is to shift our focus to those sectors around, built up around these border crosses. The border guards standing below, looking onto those migrants on the fence, the photographers, the journalists, snapping away pictures, staging the emergency on the front pages, on the newscasts. Uh, the unseen, as I mentioned, Moroccan forces on the other side, ready to do some of this uh, 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 highly controversial border work on Europe's behalf. The security companies uh, building the hardware, as we see here in a factory from southern Europe, a race of iron manufacturing, not just going to this border site of Melilla in North Africa, but also to the Hungarian border, who put in a large order from this particular company uh, in 2015. <clears throat> Shifting focus onto systems of intervention, powerful uh, systems of control built up around people's movement. So that's what I'll talk about today and see what we can learn from shifting focus in this way. And that's also what I do in my book, considering in particular, as I mentioned, the Spanish uh, case in West Africa, and Spanish attempts to halt migration into uh, the Spanish mainland, into these enclaves, and also into the Canary Islands of the West African coasts. Spain showcases, in a way, an early pioneering effort to close the borders, to externalize controls, to use that kind of language, uh, that has provided, in a way, a blueprint for what's been going on on a much larger scale in more recent years in the Mediterranean, and also now, since 2015, on EU level, as the EU seeks to build partnerships, uh, migration compacts, sets up uh, emergency trust funds with African countries, all with the intention of pushing the problem out of sight, out of mind for a while. In looking at this, I've talked about these various sectors working on the borders as an industry, an illegality industry, since it's working on fighting illegal migration, that's the terminology that's, that's being used, or a border industry. In this industry, a range of sectors are at work. Of course, the security companies, bigger defense contractors as well, providing the surveillance and machinery for the borders. The border agencies, both in Europe and outside it, as I mentioned, who see funding streams increased as they police migration in this highly punitive way. We see international and humanitarian organizations also get involved in this task. I won't talk a great deal about them, but they are a big part of the picture, and so are media outlets and also researchers, including myself. I, to some extent, consider myself as however awkwardly uh, involved, to some extent, in making migration problematic into my object of study. So we need to be aware of our positioning as academics as we study migration, however critical we may think we, we are. Uh, so I'll be considering specifically, as I said, the Spanish-African borderlands and what's been going on there over the past two decades and lessons from what happened there for what's going on in Europe right uh, at this moment and in European attempts to outsource migration control. But also look beyond this case, considering the US-Mexico border in particular, to draw out some of the logics in these systems of intervention, to see what shared logics are involved and how we may understand them and perhaps be able to criticize them more thoroughly. I'm also bringing comparative cases, and again, like I said, this is quite tentative, from two other securitized interventions, the war on drugs and the war on terror. Uh, I'll throw in as much as I can, uh, and I hope I'm not going to run out of time, but you simply have to stop me, uh, because there's, there's quite a bit that could potentially be covered. Again, like I said, this is based on uh, work I'm doing together with my colleague David Keane. Uh, his book, Useful Enemies, set out some really important parameters of the various uh, winners from uh, long, long drawn-out warfare, whether that's the war on terror, civil wars, or other kinds of conflict. And we're trying to think about that in tandem, together with our third area. We haven't looked at so much, either of us, uh, the drug wars, the war on drugs, represented here by a landmark report, also from the London School of Economics. So I'll try to bring that in, and let's see how far it, it, it works out. But I'm really happy for your, your comments. <clears throat> 
I'm going to start with uh, a story from my own fieldwork uh, as I set off as an anthropologist to study irregular maritime migration into Spain in 2010. <clears throat> I came at this topic after an earlier putative crisis at the borders of Europe. This is a picture from 2006, a very striking one, of uh, fishing boats from West Africa full of migrants arriving into the port of the Canary Islands of West African coasts while a tourist looks on uh, on his inflatable mattress in the background. This was, we should recall, the crisis at the borders of Europe is long running now. It's become perennial well, well before the moment of emergency that was announced uh, in 2015. This has been happening for quite some time. So as I set out to study this phenomenon, I came into West Africa to, to Senegal, uh, Senegal's capital, Dakar, as a field worker with the idea of, again, hearing migrant stories, their side of the picture, go beyond this spectacular framing of migration to understand on a very human level what it means to cross borders in this manner, to become in the eyes of border authorities illegal as you uh, move across a border late at night somewhere in West Africa, as you gradually move north and eventually embark on one of these boats and appear on the radar screens of the border guards. What does this uh, do to, to, a, to a person when you're taking such risks with your, with your life or when you put yourself in the hands of the authorities in this way. But as I came into the neighborhoods uh, on, the, on the, the fringes of, of Dakar, the Senegalese capital, I was in for a bit of a surprise as I sought out some of these former migrants that tried to arrive into uh, Spain in 2006. I had thought that meeting up with deportees who had tried to arrive on these boats a few years earlier and then been sent back by Spain it was a good starting point. They had set up associations to defend their rights as deportees. And one day I met uh, the president of one such association, uh, Mohamedou, in his neighborhood on the outskirts of Dakar, a fishing village that had been particularly hard hit by this form of migration. Many local youths had died in the waves. Those had been sent back, had lost all their savings. They had huge debts run up. They, they really faced a very tough time and the stigma of not making it for their families, for their communities. Mohamedou came ambling to me on, 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 the, on the sandy road <coughs> in this neighborhood and he, and, he, and he said a brief unsmiling hello and led me into the lanes to talk to him about his association, his work. As we work, he asked me a very blunt question. What can you offer us? He asked. And soon after that, uh, uh, and what do you want? Uh, the order of his question seemed to be the wrong way around. Why do you ask someone what you can offer us before you ask what? what you want from us. But the reason was simply that they'd seen too many visitors already uh, in their neighborhood since the return. We sat down in a courtyard and Mohamedou got his notebook out. A friend joined us as well as he flicked through page after page of the names and numbers, emails of all those visitors who had come to see his association since their deportation. There were contact details of journalists, researchers, students, NGO workers, even an EU delegate all the way from Brussels adorning his pages. He had never heard back from any of them, he said. A lot of people have passed by here, he told me, but every time they go back to Europe, there's nothing. His friend shared out his only cigarette and Mohamedou drew the last bit of smoke out of its dying embers. They eat from us, he said, using the local idiom of making money out of the deportees. Even the aid organizations ate their money, he said, while the deportees got nothing. I'm the president of our association, Mohamedou told us, and I have to ask my friend here for a cigarette. Do you think this is normal? Now, as I left them on the, on the, in the courtyard that day, I realized that I couldn't continue with my old topic of studying migrants on their own. I had to shift my gaze in a way, and they, they helped me, these deputies helped me to reframe my analysis. They were, in a way, the co-analysts of this system that I started to take as my object of study. I was intrigued by what Mohamed had told me, and especially when he said that there's lots of money in illegal migration, only not for him and his colleague. Uh, what he was asking himself, what his friends were asking themselves, were who gains from illegal migration and how. And I use the term illegal here, by the way, in the way my informants used it. Uh, this, was, this was the terminology that was going around both among border officials and migrants, former migrants themselves. So I started again to shift the gaze onto these various sectors, uh, at the core of which were 
a range of border security actors. <clears throat> The EU border agency Frontex, set up in 2004, and which saw itself uh, uh, really in a laboratory in the mid-Atlantic when this border crisis had hit in 2006. It was setting up a pioneering joint maritime operation called HERA uh, that really uh, provided a blueprint for the type of patrolling we've seen in later years around other parts of uh, the European external borders and borderlands. Now, the Spanish... Uh, government playing a key role here in the Spanish border guards, the civil guards, receiving a large amount of money to do this kind of patrolling. A lot of resources poured into this initiative as Spanish civil guard vessels were patrolling the African coastlines uh, right in front of Mohamedou's fishing village on the outskirts of Dakar. You could see that boat go past every day, uh, preventing uh, Senegalese citizens from leaving their own country uh, in the first place. <coughs> There were the collaborating states, I, I put uh, Morocco here on the slide, but Senegal, uh, Mauritania, Mali, the Gambia, Guinea, the list was long. Uh, Spain involved all these countries in controls through a range of initiatives. They suddenly set up a large development plan for West Africa, Plan Africa, poured development money into the region. They set up embassies across these countries where they previously ha hardly had a diplomatic presence. They were providing sweeteners of all kinds in order to get these governments to sign up to patrolling agreements, to deportation agreements of the kind uh, that had sent Mohammed and his friends back from the Canary Islands. And indeed, uh, these deportees, they knew all of them, the, the exact figure on their head in a way that the Senegalese president, they said, had earned from accepting them back. They put a price tag on themselves. They knew someone, in this case, the Senegalese government, was making money out of their misfortune. We have, as I mentioned, the security sectors providing a lot of the machinery for this as new control centers went up in the Canary Islands along mainland European coasts to monitor the vast borderlands and the seas. New surveillance system, uh, radars, all sorts of technologies being rolled out. <clears throat> and I've also scattered around here a, a few satellites, uh, including NGOs, aid organizations, research institutes, uh, and migrant associations. Even Muhammadu's own deputy association was in on the game. They were saying, we are the ones who are really fighting migration on Europe's behalf. The funders should come and talk to us. Uh, and they were doing this since there was a lot of aid and money going into risk awareness racing against migration and other associations benefiting from this European manner. And they were now trying to tap into that unsuccessfully as it turned out. I won't get to the other bits here, but uh, we'll come back to uh, the role of smugglers <coughs> in a minute. So shifting our gaze in, in the direction that my initial informants were helping me to do revealed quite a large institutional apparatus, very complex set of actors interacting in various ways to control the borders and to control, crack down on and, and push back this kind of migration into Europe. <coughs> now... <coughs> Looking at the longer trends, I'm slightly stepping away here from my field site and gradually, I guess, it will get, become more of a systemic account rather than an ethnographic one. Uh, we really see a longer trend of escalating border crisis uh, around Europe's external borders. Since the 1990s, when the first sort of regular appearances of migrant boats uh, arrived into, into Spain and Italy, at that time, when visa restrictions were put in place for, for North Africans. It was a closure of legal pathways that initiated these routes in the early 1990s, we shouldn't forget. But we really saw from the 2000s onwards a growing uh, sense of politically uh, uh, perceived crisis at the borders of escalating severity. That <clears throat> we can see quite clearly, and that I certainly saw in my interviews, including with border guards uh, over my time in fieldwork, uh, could be quite clearly correlated to border security initiatives themselves. The boat crisis, as it came to be known in the Canary Islands in 2006, was a direct follow-on from what happened in 2005 at this enclave of Melilla and his sister enclave Ceuta in North Africa, these two Spanish territories, where in anticipation of reinforcement, migrants knowing the border fences at these enclaves were about to be, uh, about to be reinforced, they staged a mass entry attempt uh, at these borders uh, 
Many of, several of them were killed in the attempt, many more expelled into desert areas. But this was really one of the first big crises at the borders of the European Union, which led to more crackdowns. It justified the building of that taller fence we saw in the first slide, and it pushed routes towards the Canary Islands, a displacement effect. Uh, shifting, and this is a map used to track migrant routes used by Frontex and other agencies, shifting routes from, uh, from the Strait of Gibraltar, from North Africa, and opening up new possibilities for migrants. You now suddenly saw a pathway opening up from West Africa all the way to the Spanish Canary Islands, one route being replaced by another. And displacement effects of this kind we've seen in crisis after crisis, and as Spain eventually so they succeeded in closing down the Atlantic route to the Canary Islands. We saw more migrants starting to use the desert route, including to Libya. And so on it goes. We see a constant shift of routes, often into more and more dangerous territory. Uh, and so a worsening of the situation. We also see that despite the rising investments in border security, even if we take the sort of uh, one-off record year of 2015 out of the equation, it's really not help push numbers down. Of course, we are seeing a shift now. We see how the EU-Turkey deal and <coughs> the Libya situation with pushbacks into Libya uh, are shifting dynamics over the past couple of years. But still, the longer trend, the underlying structural factors are still there. We're still seeing uh, that uh, this problem simply is not going away, even however much politicians try to tell us otherwise or try to push it somewhere else. Uh, <clears throat> since short, what I think we're seeing, and the, the example of, of, of West Africa and of Senegal uh, uh, testifies to this, is an interaction between border security measures and uh, smuggling routes and migrant routes. Displacement effects are constantly being created, routes pushed elsewhere and often into more dangerous territory, which usually needs the recourse uh, of smugglers. You need to use smugglers, more professionalized smugglers as well, those we have there in a little bubble, uh, to get across those most, more dangerous passages. We're seeing, in other words, an uh, increasing sense of crisis at the borders in direct interaction with border security initiatives, leading to the kind of situation we're seeing today in Libya with this report, horrific report of slave trade in Libya or uh, indefinite detention, extortion, violence against migrants in this uh, uh, North African country. <clears throat> so to summarize, uh, it's a vicious cycle here at work in combating migration. We're seeing more investments in border security, leading to more chaos, new routes emerging, which in turn fuels more panic about migration in European capitals and among voters, which then justifies more investments in border security. And on it goes, and I think we're seeing the results of that with really escalating uh, investments in these types of initiatives, in this fight against irregular migration since 2015. <clears throat> and apologies if my voice is going at this point. Now, I heard this as well once I started to travel around the borderlands and speak to the border guards themselves. So as I said, after my initial encounter with the deportees, I started to uh, work with and research uh, the border policing sector in Senegal and elsewhere in West Africa. I travelled to border control centres in Spain and beyond in Europe. Uh, I travelled up to North Africa also to look at the humanitarian side of the equation, reception centres and so forth. And I talked to the media and political actors as well, as well who were involved in this. And the, and the message I got from many of the border professionals, the border agents, was that this is not really working out for us. They would tell me things such as, migration will not, never really stop, regardless of what sort of barrier we put in people's paths. One frontline officer in, in the, the enclave of Ceuta, as he took me around this massive fence built to extremely high cost, so this fence is useless. If you're stuck on the Moroccan side, it's just going to give us a few extra minutes. You know, you're still going to try to get across. It's not going to stop anyone. Uh, someone else talking about these even bigger technological systems uh, put in place on a European level, uh, satellites for monitoring movement, radar systems and so on. So well, these satellites are useless, but the industries are happy because they are being subsidized. 
the European Commission is happy uh, and, and, you know, it's not really working out. The emperor is naked was the word I got uh, at this particular point. Someone else quite prophetically, this was a European police attaché in Senegal telling me in 2010 when you bolt all doors you'll have a pressure cooker. This was a few years before the, the sharp rise in arrivals we saw in 2014-15. Uh, the build-up of tension eventually finding a way out. So this is the kind of message I got from many border professionals themselves. Not all of them, but certainly the ambivalence around their mission was clearly present. Now, this is where I wanted to start to branch out a bit comparatively. And as you see, it's getting sort of gradually more abstract and removed from that initial fieldwork encounter. But really what I'm trying to do is to sort of give a bit of a systemic analysis of, of the logics of these kinds of operations. To that end, it's useful to look at the US-Mexico border in particular, which has been a lot easier to research than the European borderlands, and where migration scholars such as Douglas Massey has been doing this statistically for many years. <clears throat> and in a quite important piece of last year, he started to correlate a rise in the border patrol budgets. It's really meteorically been rising up since the 1980s with various trends at the US-Mexico border. He saw it correlated very closely with the cost of the crossing. He saw it correlated very closely with the, uh, with the <coughs> likelihood that a migrant would use a more dangerous crossing. He correlated very closely with a lot of factors that really add to the risks of the journey, the cost of the journey, and the dangers around that particular border. He also uh, estimated and this is, uh, I guess, the most counterintuitive point, uh, what effect a lower border patrol but it's held constant at the levels of 1986 before this sharp rise would have had on the undocumented population inland in the United States. And it found that most probably it would have been several million fewer undocumented migrants in the United States. The reason being that this controls this heavy border security operation doesn't so much deter migrants from trying, but rather deter people from leaving and circulating back and forth. You're interrupting that flow from, say, agricultural labor in Mexico, or in, in the United States, back home to your community in Mexico, and so on. People get stuck and become undocumented, long-term undocumented residents. Again, in Europe, we can think of this in the context of the border controls, the visa requirements for Moroccans in Spain, say, who in earlier decades were able to circulate back and forth after, say, the agricultural season and then suddenly found themselves without that possibility. So the border security operations, in effect, creating a bigger, much bigger undocumented population inland than would otherwise have been the case. Despite this vast, well, thanks to these vast investments in more border security. <coughs> I think we can draw some some lessons, looking at this comparatively, looking at the logics of what's going on here and the, the costs of failure, essentially, uh, of, of this kind of operation. Replicated in the European case where we're seeing a similarly sharp rise in border security investments, even though not quite yet, perhaps on the scale of the United States. <coughs> now, to look at this, a bit more systemically looking at these logics of, of uh, intervention. This is where I wanted to start bringing in the war on drugs and the war on terror in quite a tentative fashion. The reason being that uh, there's been quite some advancement, especially around the economics of the war on drugs and on drug control, that I think we can learn a lot from as migration scholars, as we look at migration controls. One of those advancements concern the critique of what's referred to as supply-centric interventions. The war on drugs and, 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 and punitive controls uh, sort of around this kind of securitized framing of fighting, combating drugs, uh, focusing on cracking down on drug routes, on supply of drugs to destination markets, on uh, capturing the big drug lords, say, of capturing the contraband and the people taking them across the borders. So, focusing on the supply into a market rather than the bigger questions around the functioning of that market, around demand in, in destination countries and so forth. We focus on supply. And that does something particular. It does something quite distressing to uh, uh, what's happening to those countries and people who are stuck in these borderlands of intervention. And it's worth just reading quickly from this slide from the report, the LSE report I mentioned earlier. <coughs> 
the pursuit of a militarized and enforcement-led global war on drug strategy has produced enormous negative outcomes and collateral damage, including mass incarceration in the US, that is the destination market of the main instigator of the war on drugs, highly repressive policies in Asia, let's just think of the Philippines for a moment, vast corruption, political destabilization in Afghanistan and West Africa, so on and so forth, and the propagation of systematic human rights abuses around the world. So large collateral damage. And I think we're seeing something very similar in this vicious cycle of migration control I mentioned earlier, where one crisis escalates into another, partly thanks to more hard-headed, securitized interventions, more fences, more patrols, uh, and more <coughs> crackdowns of different kinds. <coughs> now, we see that quite clearly in this, in this example here from, from that LSE report. Uh, in what's often referred to as the balloon effect. You squeeze the balloon of the drug trade in one place, it pops out somewhere else. So similar to the displacement effect I mentioned before, one migrant route is cracked down upon, another one opens up, often a more dangerous one. This correlates essentially uh, the <coughs> excuse me, crackdowns in Colombia, leading to a fall in cocaine supply uh, from the mid noughties onwards, correlated with a sharp rise uh, inversely correlated with a sharp rise in uh, homicide rate in Mexico, uh, which in itself is correlated with drug-related homicides. This is a time when, when uh, pre Mexican President Felipe Calderón launched his war on drugs and when we saw more of the drug trade, uh, the epicenter of the drug trade shifting towards Mexican territory. So problems in one part <coughs> of this wide market uh, spans many countries, shifting over to another leading to even more uh, dangerous situations down the line. Now to bring in yet another uh, uh, security intervention here to our, our systematic uh, picture, uh, the war on terror. And I, I know I'm sort of overreaching here, but that's partly to see what, what we get out of it in the discussion. So bear with me. Uh, here we're seeing, of course, even more investments than we have seen in drug enforcement and we have seen in border security, it's, it's counting trillions of dollars here since 2001. It could be even much more than that, this is just one estimate on the slide here. Which we're seeing at a time when terrorism related deaths have also sharply been rising since 2001. Uh, uh, going up from <coughs> I think around 3,300 in the year 2000 to 29,300 in 2015 according to the Global Terrorism Index. At the same time, according to some estimates, we've seen fighters in Islamist-inspired organizations rising from 32,000 in the year 2000 to in excess of 110,000 in 2013. So we're seeing uh, a, a more difficult security scenarios and more complicated uh, uh, risk pictures emerging at the time when we see more and more investments. And perhaps in the war on terror, we can more clearly see the relationship with uh, counter-terror interventions and invasions and the sort of grievances that stirs in, in those countries that are being invaded than we see in the other two cases. So I think we can also <coughs> help, this, this case may help illuminate some of what's going on in the other two security intervention, even though by no means they are all equal. <coughs> Rather, what I'm trying to show here is that there are certain shared logics in these security interventions for all their differences. They're all, in a way, seeking to target a supply of some sort. They're seeking to target, in the case of the war on drugs, the supply of drugs, the drug lords, the kingpins, the smugglers. In the case of migration, they're seeking to halt migration, get hold of the smugglers and punish them <coughs> and push, it, push the problem back. In the case of the war on terror, to, to kill and eliminate the terrorist masterminds and, and, the, and, and the insurgents in various cases, rather than looking at a bigger picture, the bigger markets, the bigger political and social and structural drivers behind these three phenomena. And I should say, hey, by the way, in pausing, that I'm certainly by no means equaling migration to drugs or terrorism. This is a big problem with this type of comparison, <coughs> given that we, on the one hand, are talking about people moving across borders, in the other two cases, talking about well, a toxic substance and a security threat. What I'm trying to do is to get at some of the shared logics in how certain uh, uh, problems, certain issues are being securitized and treated to uh, 
a form of emergency response that strengthens certain actors, even despite or even thanks to how the problem the ostensibly combat seem to be getting more and more complicated to deal with. So in some early strands of work I've done, and I know others have done as well, as sort of related to, to, to policy and so on, been trying to push a message that, well, what's going on here is really a failure. It's counterproductive. And this maybe uh, uh, rings a bell with certain uh, members of, of uh, say, liberal media organizations, uh, 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 good-hearted policy makers and so on, but it doesn't really work when we deal with these systems of intervention on their own terms. And not just because politicians in Europe today can certainly point to a fall in arrivals in 2015 and say, well, it works for us right now. Certainly until the next electoral cycle will be fine. So what, what is the problem here? It's certainly working for us. This certainly is also isn't enough to talk about failure and counterproductive interventions because we can't assume what the objectives are of those who instigate these types of interventions. And we certainly can't assume that it is public good that these interveners have at the top of their mind when they formulate their policies. We need to understand <coughs> not just these interventions in terms of their expressed goals of fighting migration, combating drugs, combating terrorism, but also the uh, unstated goals and the various vested interests that may perpetuate what's going on, even though on the face of it we seem to be seeing uh, more difficult situations as time goes on. So that's what I'm going to move on <coughs> to talk about now. So let's go back to this border fence um, at the Spanish enclave of Melilla. <coughs> when Spain uh, joined Schengen in the 1990s, there was initially no fence at this particular border. This was a much traversed borderlands of border trade between the Moroccan side and the Spanish side. And there were also undocumented sub-Saharan migrants who started to come across these borders at the time. This was part of the EU, so there was a clear reason for them to do so. But as they interviewed border guards in Melilla, they told me, well, they simply strolled across like everyone else. It wasn't such a big deal. And the first fence was built in the 1990s partly with, uh, with the help of EU money. And suddenly, as the border guards uh, remembered in the interview, a threat scenario emerged. Now suddenly, all these migrants had to come across at once, uh, to at least for some of them to have a chance to enter and avoid expulsion back into Morocco. They all had to try to breach that fence, go past the, 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 the lines of border police and make it into the centre of town, or otherwise they would be pushed back yet again. Very similar to what's going on at the US-Mexico border at the time, the so-called kamikaze runs, with migrants lining up on the Mexican side at nightfall, the border patrol on the other side, and off they go, and some get across, safety numbers, some get pushed back, they try again the next night, and so on. A very similar scenario. So thanks to this drama at the borders, the Spanish politicians saw, saw to that more money was going to be invested in, in barricading off this enclave taller fences, more border police in cooperation with Morocco, which, which led to more and more punitive politics within Morocco, making those sub-Saharan migrants uh, ever more desperate to get across. And this was again one of the uh, relatively easier ways to get out of that situation, to get into Europe. So we saw growing pressure over the early 2000s on this particular border crossing, leading, as I mentioned, to this crisis in 2005 where thousands of migrants tried to enter Melilla and a sister enclave of Ceuta being fought back and gunshots fired, some of them dying. Again, in, the, in anticipation of reinforcement of this border that was coming anyway. And we then saw, uh, again as I mentioned, the border being reinforced uh, as a thanks to this mass entry attempt, thanks to this crisis, pushing migrants away for a while towards the Canary Islands route. But then as we see in this slide, They've come back over more recent years, often in more and more distressing ways, clinging onto the fences uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, trying to make it across and dying sometimes in the attempt. As a result, the Spanish government has reinforced this message that we must close down this border. They've added race wire to the fence. It was removed for a while, for a few years. They've added an anti-climbing mesh so you can't stick your fingers into the fence. Uh, <coughs> and now Morocco has also built another fence outside the triple fencing of this barrier, expanding this fence structure 
into Moroccan soil. And on it goes in a sort of cycle of reinforcement that keeps on happening uh, in response to the latest arrivals. <coughs> so we're seeing here on the one hand, and it's, it's the vicious cycle I mentioned before, of more chaos at the borders leading to more border security. But that vicious cycle is of course also a virtuous cycle for many actors. Coming back to the deportee Mohamedou I mentioned at the beginning, you said there's lots of money in illegal migration, but certainly for the companies providing these fencing structures, this is quite a boon. For the border guards who patrol it, it's become a major source of uh, uh, income for ailing border agencies and on manpower. Uh, similarly, on the Moroccan side, these fences become uh, quite an important uh, uh, point of reference politically and also financially in its dealings with the EU. So there's many actors that stand to gain from this type uh, of intervention. <coughs> so again, that's partly what I've been looking at, trying to shift focus from simply the costs of failure or business as usual to the gains by these various security actors. Uh, and here are just a few of them uh, that I've already been through to some extent, so I won't repeat it all here. We've seen in Spain a sharp rise in the number of border guards over uh, the past decade or so. We've seen a sharp rise in patrolling agreements, all sorts of aid deals with neighbouring states. I mentioned the West Africa case. We now have larger such agreements on our hands uh, through the African Emergency Trust Fund on the EU level, migration compacts with countries such as Mali, Senegal, Ethiopia, that oblige them to collaborate in controls and deportations in exchange for various financial or other diplomatic favours. More and more investments in the border security industry, and we should recall that these are not passive actors by any means. They've actively been pushing for more investments and providing, pitching their solutions to political decision makers in the EU and on member state levels. Look, we have uh, a solution here. Uh, maybe sometimes even framing it as a humanitarian one. Look, if we only have this surveillance system in place for everyone's uh, 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 benefit, we're going to be able to de detect and deter people before they risk their lives. We see that kind of reasoning in the Spanish Civil Guard have been at the forefront of this, pioneering this uh, on a European level as a border agency, uh, <coughs> as a law enforcement agency, and among uh, many of the actors involved in the defence and security industry. <coughs> it's extremely hard to put exact figures on this, and maybe uh, someone like Martin in the audience here is better at this than, than me. Uh, just to give one example of, of one attempt to tally uh, the cost of this kind of intervention. Last year, <coughs> the Overseas Development Institute in London said at least 1.7 billion euros have been committed to border policing measures from 2014 to 2016 alone. And so this is just a fraction, actually, of the real cost. We don't know the real cost because member states are not sharing their data. Uh, so this is quite a meaningless figure, but just gives you a sense of the scale. And in collaboration with neighbouring states, they put a figure over that same time period of more than 15 billion euros based on the EU-Turkey deal and two targeted trust funds for Syria and Africa. And again, that only being one part or many more deals and many more trade-offs with neighbouring states. <coughs> now, in the US-Mexico case, we see we have clearer data. It's much more transparent in a way. We've seen the budget of the Customs and Border Enforcement, the mother agency of the Border Patrol, rise sharply to some $12 billion a year, and the rise in the number of Border Patrol agents sharply going up, even at a time when uh, apprehensions of migrants per agent is sharply going down owing to demographic shifts in Mexico. There are fewer Mexicans trying to get across, but it still keeps on growing. <coughs> so we're seeing these kinds of cycles of investments, and we certainly would need to ask our uh, politicians, our governments, and the EU in Europe, where is all this money going, how much is it, and have some transparency on this front. I think that would be a key policy takeaway, really. <coughs> now, there are also many political benefits to staging this kind of migration as an emergency. We should recall that for many years, leaving out of the equation 2015 and 2016, uh, the number of migrants using these routes is relatively minor relative to other ways of entering the European Union, including for irregular migrants often arrive with a visa and overstay it uh, by flight, like everyone else, but they don't end up on the evening news. But for various reasons, the kind of scenario we saw on that Spanish border has been used and mobilized by politicians and by the media, of course, uh, to stage a certain politics 
of fear. And I think we don't need to go into too much detail on that uh, to, to see uh, what's been going on. We have examples of that kind when uh, Italy's Berlusconi kept Tunisians stranded on tiny Lampedusa in front of the world's cameras, announcing a national emergency in 2011. We've seen it in Calais on the UK-French border and so on. So there are certain political gains in staging this as a particular kind of problem, framing it for voters and audiences across Europe. Again, the war on drugs is instructive here. <coughs> this is just one fairly distressing quote from a former advisor to President Nixon on how the war on drugs was useful politically to target a certain political opposition at the time uh, and also to target the black community in particular through criminalization and uh, incarceration. Uh, we're seeing political usages of these types of intervention that go along with economic gains from for the agencies, the, the companies, and other actors involved in them. <clears throat> that again, I think we can learn from these, these parallels. Why are we targeting these particular kinds of migration in such a highly visible way? Now, <clears throat> the war on terror, again, is quite instructive here. Even if we just look at the basic figures of investments, these figures, on the one hand, seen as a failure. We're investing so much in this, and yet see the proliferation of attacks, but of course for uh, the various agencies and the part of the military industrial complex in the United States who are facing quite a crunch point at the end of the Cold War, the war on terror has been a real boon, it's really revived uh, their, their prospects for a new century. <coughs> and so, so it has for many of those companies and security contractors involved in this business. <coughs> on the one hand, it looks like uh, a real uh, uh, overspending a destructive way of using taxpayer money on the other as a real gain for both. On the both public, part of the public sector involved in this type of security operation and the private sector. <clears throat> now, we're shifting now to uh, the African side of the border. This is a picture from a, a border patrol I joined uh, along Dakar's coast in 2010 in a Spanish provided uh, patrolling uh, vehicle, a quad bike. Uh, on a patrol was paid for with extra pay from uh, Spanish coffers in order to police migration before people leave the Senegalese coastline. So I was hanging out with these police, policemen along the, course, <coughs> the coastline of Dakar. And as you see in this picture, it's being put to good use by a local girl trolling up on this quad bike and just sort of generally sitting around and not <coughs> doing a great deal. The police officers moaning about the role here. On the one hand, they were gaining from this type of outsourced migration control, uh, but on the other, they felt themselves excluded from the higher sort of layers of that uh, fight against migration. Well, we never get to go to these fancy border policing conferences in Europe. It's our bosses who go. They are the ones who make the real money out of this. We never get to meet these civil guards who are patrolling in their boat just, uh, just sort of <laughs> a few hundred meters away from us. They were kind of quite resentful, and we're now we're resisting the role by not really making a huge effort. They were sort of sitting around in, in their patrolling vehicles and, 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 and <coughs> watching, watching people go by. A very similar scenario as I joined them up on the border between Senegal and Mauritania, really not spotting any migrants. It's impossible to spot any potential uh, irregular migrants at that border crossing. These are borders that have always been crossed by traders, by families, by seasonal workers on both sides, and it's completely impossible to do this sort of preemptive crackdown on Europe's behalf in any sort of uh, in any sort of effective fashion. They knew it, but they still were receiving uh, the income for doing that. <coughs> so I'm shifting here, folks, to the gains in partner countries, which uh, is really a key part where we see some vested interest playing into more investments in border security, and I'm aware of time here. I'm sort of slightly talking too much here. This tends to be the case, but I'll do what I can in, in as short as amount of time as possible, I promise you. <clears throat> so if I saw some ambivalence, resistance on that very local level, these disgruntled uh, police officers sitting around on a beach saying, you know, we don't want to patrol Europe on uh, the beaches on Europe's behalf, really. We see, of course, a much bigger uh, uh, potential for fighting back, if you will, among more powerful governments, and especially so in Europe's immediate neighborhood in North Africa and Turkey. Essentially what we've seen is European 
governments exporting, if you will, a notion uh, of migration, uh, certain kinds of migration, as a security issue to these countries. And these governments running with it because they're receiving uh, various forms of concessions, financially or politically, for doing so, but at the same time they can then start using this threat of migration as a bargaining chip in various ways in relations with Europe. Now we saw this in the most recent entries into these enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla <coughs> in, in, in North Africa in, in early 2017, when European court decisions said, well, Western Sahara needs to be excluded from trade deals between the EU and Morocco, and suddenly Moroccan authorities pipe up and say, we're not going to keep on playing the role of gendarme of Europe. And suddenly, there were no controls on the Moroccan side of the border. Suddenly, yet another migration crisis sort of emerged at these enclaves. We've seen similar cases down the years. At that earlier moment of this crisis in the Canary Islands in 2006, was a moment when the West African country, Mauritania, had just undergone a coup d'etat. And now, suddenly, all these boats were coming across. There were no real controls. What did that mean? Well, now the European interlocutors, governments, EU delegates, had to speak to the new uh, military government in Mauritania. Uh, they now they couldn't do anything else. They had to, in a way, recognize them. Uh, and so on it goes. I think we keep seeing this selective usage of migration as a resource, as a bargaining chip, or as what author Kelly Greenhill calls a weapon of mass migration uh, against uh, these partner states, now this is, uh, these funders essentially, uh, in, in, in Europe. So we're seeing a very ambivalent and complicated relationship emerging here, with many economic and political gains from neighbouring states, who may in the face of it play along with the official goal of fighting migration, but at the same time subverting it, undermining it, or at least keeping threat levels at an adequate level in order to keep our pressure <coughs> on the European Union. I think Turkey is certainly a case in point there, uh, and they've made that quite explicit over the past year. Now, in terms of economic gains, we could even look to uh, lovely fellows such as these ones, uh, Rapid Support Forces of Sudan, formerly Janjaweed, <coughs> who, in uh, speaking up in the media in Sudan over the past year or two, saying, well, we are out there on the borders of Sudan arresting all these smugglers. Come talk to us, because they know it's a lot of EU money <coughs> through Migration Partnership Framework, through these trust funds, through the Khartoum process, trying to halt migration from the Horn of Africa onwards to Libya, that they can tap into if they manage to become those privileged local security actors. In Niger, the flashpoint for EU interventions currently, uh, <coughs> the government has said, well, we need a billion euros to fight migration adequately. You need to really come and, come and fund us as much as you possibly can. Eritrea, uh, a very brutal regime, that is also seeing political leverage uh, if not financial, from this type of security framing. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is a, is a very large collateral damage, if you will, to how uh, Western states, in this case European states, interact with uh, neighbouring partner states, especially African ones, who are in a much less powerful position. Uh, framing the relationship in terms of security, in terms of border security, in terms of fighting mobility. <clears throat> now, this can have knock-on effects in terms of displacement into new areas, like I mentioned. It can have, create more distressing types of arrival situations, fomenting smuggling networks. But it can also affect regional mobility, sort of second-order effect that I saw myself in Mauritania and Senegal with uh, Senegalese citizens being expelled from working seasonally in Mauritania simply to bump up the numbers. The Mauritanian authorities had to show at a time when the number of irregular migrants trying to set out for Spain were falling, but they still had enough migrants in the pot, as it were, to justify receiving more resources and recognition from their more powerful funders, donors, partners in Europe. And we then see also this selective usage of migration as a bargaining ship, as a strategic tool in, uh, in putting pressure and gaining leverage at a certain moment. And we're certainly not going to see that go away. Instead, the more we put focus with securitized framing, threat-based framing around migration, I think the more we're going to see this kind of staging of active crisis, this gaming or double gaming in, as, of, of, of migration. So on the one hand, fighting, and on the other hand, uh, uh, sort of keeping it going to some extent. <clears throat> 
Again, if I had time, I would draw in uh, uh, other uh, uh, security interventions more thoroughly. This is a recent report by my colleague uh, David Keane on the war on terror in Syria. And now we see similar <coughs> usage uh, of uh, threats by, in this case, Bashar al-Assad's regime in selectively uh, uh, seeking not to target, so the argument goes, uh, ISIS in various forms of military campaigns, even setting jihadists free from prison and sort of stoking the threat that you, this regime can then say, we are the most well-placed to deal with. We are the necessary interlocutor who you need. So on the one hand, stoking, on the one hand, fighting. It's a very effective strategy. <clears throat> and I think the clearest case we see on this, uh, in the case of migration, which maybe we can dwell on later on, the discussion is Libya and Gaddafi and how he used migration very strategically, uh, stoking threats, uh, telling Europe he needed some 5 billion euros uh, a year in order to avoid Europe turning black. And then once NATO uh, uh, attacked, he said he was going to unleash an unprecedented wave of illegal migration on European shores, even allegedly uh, forcibly embarking uh, migrants towards Lampedusa to put this into practice. And all this sort of being the heritage, if you will, that the new uh, conflictive authorities in Libya now have to build on as, as migrants, sub-Saharan African migrants are being abused in Libya today. Anyway, we'll need to move on. <laughs> and I promise I will wrap up soon. So we're seeing on the one hand then <clears throat> spiraling costs of these kinds of intervention of the fight against migration. We're seeing more distressing situation emerging as a result, but we're also seeing various economic and political gains in the instigating states, in the core states, and among the core security actors of this system, <clears throat> as well as among the partners who can subvert the official rules, if you will, of engagement uh, by gaining leverage through fighting migration. But I want to take us back to the core states, the powerful interveners uh, in, in Europe in this case, and uh, the gains to them in another sense, in terms of distribution of the risks and the dangers that are created on a systemic level by continuing with business as usual. It's just a very simple illustration, as we, many of us know, the proportion of the world's refugees are hosted by richer nations has sharply gone down over the past decade or so. <clears throat> Again, this is a sort of uh, distribution of certain risks as seen from Western capitals that may be an outcome of the deterrence policies being put in place. There are certain gains here on a systemic level that we need to take account of. Uh, we see, in a way, an unequal portioning out of the risks that emerge from this type of security intervention. We have, on the one hand, what might be called upside risks, the sort of uh, 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 risk that more powerful actors can assume <coughs> without endangering themselves in any real way. That would be the case for the security companies providing the hardware. There's no real risk in it to them of providing this technology. They're not out there dealing with this. This is really uh, quite a nice deal for many actors, including those high up uh, border officials uh, in, in border agencies who also advocate for this type of solution. On the other hand, we have the downside risks dealt with, of course, by migrants themselves and refugees who drown as a result of these policies, but also by state authorities in countries where people arrive in distressing situations, humanitarians, volunteers, who are out there trying to rescue people, even border guards themselves, the sort of frontline border guards, who, as you remember, were quite critical of what's going on on some levels, who often have to pull people out of the waters and even put their own lives at risk at some time, sometimes. And also the so-called buffer states, the transit states, <coughs> which on the one hand can see certain gains from fighting migration on their own terms, but on the other hand often left to deal with the outcomes. Morocco, Libya, Turkey, dealing with a very difficult situation as a result of this system of intervention. The main risks of this business as usual being distributed onto actors that are less uh, financially capable to deal with them and away from the core border security actors. Revisiting the war on drugs slide, this slide here of rising fatalities in Mexico as a result of a push around of, of the drug trade again can be presented in, in this case in Washington as a win to some extent. I mean, this is a risk that we don't deal with. It's pushed somewhere else. We're distributing it in a fashion that suits our purposes. Even though the risk, the dangers may grow over time, uh, <coughs> we 
are still sort of winning in terms of how we transfer risks away to other actors. And indeed, that's one of the key conclusions of this LSE-IDS report. Even though we may see a certain drop uh, of <coughs> in consumption of drugs in destination countries, we see a transfer of many of these collateral risks onto less powerful actors and states. Terrorism as well, revisit this slide here, and the three key countries we're seeing a sharp rise in terrorist-related deaths are Iraq, Nigeria, Afghanistan. Only 3%, <coughs> I think, is the figure of all terrorist-related deaths <coughs> since, I think, the year 2000 to 2014, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, took place in the West. Again, we're seeing an uneven distribution and transfer of risks to, to other actors within these systems. <coughs> so, I don't know if this helps at all, this slide, but essentially... Uh, what I'm interested in here is some of the logics from inside these systems and how they can be justified over the longer term, given their costs, given their collateral damage. We see a constant push out, a transfer of risks and costs onto those buffer actors away from the core dominant security and political actors in the instigating states onto other actors, including in the civilian field, including in neighboring states <coughs> having to deal with a problem. And whenever there's blowback, whenever systemic danger re-emerges as it does, again, an attempt to deflect that back, systemically portioning it out, transferring it away from those core actors. <coughs> so, in a way, I started off with a conundrum here of how to explain that these systems of intervention keep perpetuating themselves in the face of their evident failings, problems, distressing consequences. Well, part of the reason has to be found in the distribution of cost and benefits within these systems. Who gains, what are the vested interests, and also how is risk and danger uh, uh, of different kinds portioned out to actors unequally, uh, and how may that help explain what's going on. I'm aware I've given a very sort of abstract presentation, qu quite tentative in part. And I just want to flag up a little caveat before concluding very briefly, uh, as I will, <laughs> uh, regarding the role of normal human beings in all, in all of this. And in a way, it's ironic. I think uh, my writing as an anthropologist has been very much about the personal stories and about the accounts of these migrants, the border guards, the aid workers who grapple with these faceless systems. <coughs> and indeed, one thing that I think I've seen, and many of us who work on this phenomenon have seen, is really uh, the capacity to, to act that, that, that people on the move themselves have, even in situations such as this, where we have often seen an active staging of this kind of spectacle of migration on behalf of migrants themselves, who want to perhaps call their plight into, sort of put their plight in the front of the national media, and sort of call attention to the distress they are undergoing. I saw that myself in fieldwork, a reception camp in the enclave of Ceuta, where migrants staged a protest against being stranded indefinitely, as they were in this tiny enclave, uh, crying out for attention from the national news media, and in the end, ending up on the Spanish evening news, and some of them, as a result, seeing the policy shift and being sent on to mainland Spain. It's an amazing capacity here to shift the, the dynamics of these systems in <clears throat> among migrants themselves and also among these various conflictive sectors and actors, including border police, NGOs, humanitarian actors, whoever they are, who certainly don't all cohabit easily uh, in a systemic sense. They keep on pulling in different directions. And it's certainly not a done deal that the system will keep perpetuating itself indefinitely. <coughs> now, one way, and this is just to conclude one minute, uh, in which the system does manage to perpetuates itself indefinitely is through another failure, in quotation marks, of evaluation, how public debates <coughs> are framed around these types of evaluation. Uh, and I think this is where we as academics may have some impact. I think there are many uh, policy proposals that can be put in place to how we should shift towards legal migration pathways, we should shift and reformate our cooperation with neighboring states of migration, away from a security framing, we should de-escalate the rhetoric, get away from this emergency rhetoric. There are many things we can push for, but I think giving the systemic logics of what's going on, the vested interests, politically and economically, 
uh, we're very unlikely to see any leeway there. But I think perhaps if we work on the parameters of evaluation and how these topics are talked about in terms of success and failure in the public realm, we may have some impact. And I show this slide here of boat arrivals into Spain over the years, uh, simply because when I was doing fieldwork in the Canary Islands, a Spanish government delegate showed me this. And he basically only showed me the bit starting at 2006 with a peak up to 2010 when the arrivals went down. I said, look, we're doing a great job here. Our arrivals are going down. Our policy is working. It was completely leaving out of the picture that these arrivals had only spiked uh, thanks to his very own government's interventions in North Africa, if you recall, the crackdowns in North Africa, opening new routes, new possibilities for migrants to arrive into Europe. So leaving out part of the picture, framing evaluation very narrowly in spatial, temporal terms around uh, migrant figures and not looking that much beyond that. And we see something very similar in the war on drugs, the war on terror, bite-sized evaluations serving political purposes rather than taking into account the broader temporal spatial trend or indeed the broader costs, the negative externalities, if you will, to borrow from the language uh, in, 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 in climate change debate. So we need a different kind of systems analysis to look at the full costs and benefits of this type of intervention. I won't uh, uh, go into any detail on this here, and certainly it's very tentative, but I think here we can learn, and this is partly why I wanted to draw in the war on drugs, we can learn what's been happening in that field in particular. Where there's been a shift, there's been a momentum around different kinds of evaluation. A certain country such as Colombia, which had once signed up to the war on drugs, now shifting their policy, seeing the collateral damage of what they were doing before, seeing the social and human costs and political costs of what was going on, and sort of shifting tack and trying to sign up, however imperfectly, to another approach. We can learn across these different kinds of intervention how to shift, in a way, the way we evaluate them, how we delineate the costs and benefits within these systems, and not just in look at the migrants themselves. And to end, I know it's kind of a depressing topic for us here, but to end again on another positive example, not just the war on drugs, we've seen a certain shift, but of course climate change. We've seen a lot of movement on this, on moving away from looking at business as usual in economic terms to polluter pays, to negative externalities. What are the costs of business as usual to other actors in social terms, in public health terms in this case? What are the costs to the public good of continuing? down the same path as before. And I think it's an indictment of our, of our political climate today <clears throat> that in the war on drugs, that is, in crackdowns on a toxic substance, we've seen some movement. We've seen a slight shift in the public debate. But when it comes to the movement of people, of human beings, across borders, we haven't seen that yet. And I think that's one area where I think coalitions of academics, uh, activists, uh, NGOs, uh, policymakers and others could make a difference. And I've talked a lot, but I'll finish now. Thank you. <coughs>